Hello and welcome to another episode of the SERS Group Podcast. I'm JC. And I'm Barbara. And today we are talking about SERS genes and we're going to kind of break down the two different ways the genes become involved in the SERS diagnosis and treatment process. Before we jump in, just a reminder that none of this is medical advice. If you are looking to change up your own treatment protocol, make sure you clear that with your SERS provider. I'm excited. Genetics, guys. We and we've had some uh <laughs> we've had some questions in the SERS group about this uh from members and it is worth taking a whole episode to uh really hammer in the details of what the heck is like the genetic test which is part of the diagnostic process specifically and then also the genie test which I know we have covered separately in a past episode and of course we'll link that in the show notes in case you want to get a little bit more detail on that side as well but Without further ado, let's get into it. Yeah, and I think we wanted to clarify this really because I think there's some confusion because when you get your initial blood work done, they test your genes to check if you're susceptible for SIRS. Chronic inflammatory response syndrome happens when you have a genetic predisposition to being really bad at eliminating a biotoxin, you encounter that biotoxin. So in that blood work, they're looking for those genes. But then we've also talked about and had episodes on the genie test, which is showing the expression of different genes. And so because it's like genes and genes, I think there's some confusion about the role each of those tests play. Right. And um, spoiler alert, I guess, they're both kind of expensive tests, one much more than the other, but they, um, uh, at least uh, with the HLA test, you only need to do it once because it's literally like how your body's programmed to be. Uh, and that part doesn't change, but we'll go, I'm like skipping ahead. So I'm going to just shut up and let JC <laughs> start us off. So the genetic test you get as part of the initial diagnosis, you might hear it referred to as the HLA or haplotype testing, and it's literally looking for the presence of genes that show that you are susceptible to SIRS. It's static. Like if you had genes to have green eyes, you have green eyes. It doesn't change over time. You have that, those genes. So it also can help you understand what you might have been triggered by in terms of your SIRS. There's some haplotypes that are mold susceptible, some are MS, like you're susceptible to low MSH, some are Lyme or vaccine related, but it's not necessarily showing you what you're currently reacting to. So once that SIRS gene is triggered and bam, now you have SIRS, any of the biotoxins can continue to keep you sick. Right. And it's worth noting in this moment that even if you don't have the genetic haplotype for SIRS, you can still get it, though it's incredibly rare. And of course, the bottom line is biotoxins aren't good for anyone. If you are currently living in a moldy environment or you take a dip into red tide, uh, if you're on your vacation in Florida, uh, still not good for you and you still may get sick. But in that case, those people who do not have the genetic haplotype, uh, more than nine times out of 10 will be able to detox it on their own once they're out of exposure without any help of binders and other things. So that's why SIRS people, which is about one in four people uh, that have that genetic predisposition, they their body won't be able to eliminate those biotoxins on their own. And that's what causes SIRS or chronic inflammatory response syndrome and what kind of requires something like the Shoemaker Protocol to treat it. And there is a really great talk on SIRS Summit. If you didn't catch the live showing of the SIR Summit, you can still buy the replays and you have access to them for six months. But Dr. Scott McMahon did a, an interview with Dr. Christian Navarro Torres, and they talk about the haplotypes and that genetic susceptibility and kind of how that works. The really cool thing about the haplotypes is if you have kids, you can test your kids and then you, if they have the predisposition for SIRS, you can give them the knowledge so that hopefully they never get sick. So it could be like a consideration for where they go to school, what dorm room they stay in, all of those things. But really, I think that's the power of the haplotype testing is when you do have children and you can kind of pass that knowledge on to them and hopefully they never get it. Maybe kind of a, a, a more common or, or maybe well, more well-known example of this is like celiac disease. Like if you know that you have it, you might want to test your kid for that so you know to avoid gluten so that doesn't actually trigger the illness itself to 
uh, get upregulated and cause a whole problem for them. I don't know if it's, ex it's it might not be exactly the same, but I think it's similar and a decent example to give. And right now, there's no way to impact this gene or remove this gene if you if you have the genetic predisposition for SIRS. It's essentially saying you can't create the antibodies that'll help you remove the biotoxins. So as far as we know right now, there's no way to change that. It doesn't change based on the genetic expression. Again, it's very static. Like if you have green eyes, you always have green eyes. If you have the SIRS genes, you have that predisposition towards SIRS. And the last thing I'll say, well, actually two more things. One is it does have to be calculated. So you're going to get it. The blood work is going to come back and it's just going to look like gibberish to you. Your provider will interpret it for you, but there's also a really great resource at myhousemakesmesick.com. And you can put in the different codes and it'll calculate it for you to tell you what your haplotype is. And if you are thinking about doing that and that sounds overwhelming, well, I would be right there with you. I uh, When I got mine tested, my uh, practitioner figured that out, translated it for me. Because to me, looking at a sea of letters, I, I mean, I don't know. I wouldn't have been able, especially in the midst of SIRS, to like even be able to pull those numbers out in order to put it into a calculator. But if you have someone in your life who can do that for you, who is not dyslexic or <laughs> has ADHD or other issues where they can't figure that out, uh, that could be something that you can get some help with. But, uh, you know, you should be seeing a, a practitioner anyway. So they are certainly capable of helping you out with that as well. And I think that's how most people figure out what their haplotype is. Their doctor tells them. Yeah. And the last thing I'll say is I've had some questions because I have HLA-B27. So it is a haplotype and it's related to spondylarthropathies. So I was diagnosed with ankylosing spondylitis, which I found out was triggered by SIRS. Um, so some people have asked, like, are the, these autoimmune genes, these autoimmune susceptible genes, SIRS genes? And the answer to that is we don't know right now. Hopefully they do more testing in the future. It wasn't shown as statistically significant towards SIRS. That's how they identified these haplotypes in the first place. But to Barbara's point, there's a small percentage of people who aren't captured by the haplotypes. Like they could have SIRS, but they don't have the genetic predisposition. And it's a really small percentage, like less than 1%, I believe. Um, but it could be that there are SIRS genes that haven't been identified yet. And so as research continues, you may see more pop up over time. And if you want to see a really cool talk about autoimmune diseases and SIRS, there was another really great talk at the SIRS Summit. It was by Dr. Miles Nichols. I really enjoyed that one. I mean, I specifically did because I have an autoimmune disease, but it was really interesting. Absolutely. And again, we'll make sure to uh, link to the summit in the show notes as well, if you're interested in checking out those and lots of other talks. There's a ridiculous amount of talks, like 50 something talks. So enjoy that if you haven't already. So now we can kind of transition the conversation to the genie, which is another test that is both diagnostic, but can also inform treatment. And we recently did a podcast episode with Dr. Christian Navarro Torres. So if you want to get into, you know, the finer details of the genie and how it can be used to inform treatment, definitely recommend that episode. But you can get this at any point in your treatment. It's really helpful if you can afford it at the start of your treatment, because it's going to show you exactly what you're responding to in that moment. It's kind of like a snapshot in time of what you might be reacting to. So it can prevent you from going down rabbit holes you don't need to, especially very early on. But if you can't afford it at the beginning or you're overwhelmed by the thought of getting it at the beginning, another great time to look at getting the genie is if you do stall in your treatment. Yeah, and that's exactly what I did. I know if you've seen the genie episode, you know, but I did stall and I couldn't really figure out what the heck I still needed to do in my house. My uh, testing looked good. Generally, I felt okay. Um, but the genie test I did showed that I was currently reacting to endotoxins, and that gave me a path forward. Now I could test for that. I can take a closer look at my appliances, which I did. And I think that was a pretty key piece for me. And I think I did it probably a year, maybe almost a year and a half into my SIRS treatment. So again, not at the beginning at all, um, but it was still very informative for me in helping inform my treatment, figure out how to make my environment safer for myself and uh, make those changes to impact my health. And I, yeah, I think I've been doing a lot better ever since.
And the big difference between the genie and the haplotypes is that the genie shows gene expression. So it's not looking for the presence of genes, it's looking for the expression of genes. Inflammation can up or down regulate different genes and the pattern of that up or down regulation is going to show downstream effects like hypometabolism. Maybe you're bad at detoxing. Again, go watch that episode we did with Christian if you're interested in seeing this in action because he actually looks through a genie report with us. But the cool thing is, is you'll actually see that report change over time. So if you do get the genie at the start or when you stall and then you get it later on, you should see those up and down regulations change over time. Yeah. And I think it was referred to uh, by Louise Carter as like the Christmas lights uh, being turned on or off because uh, uh, healthy or or, you know, um, I guess normal. I hate using that word genie. It looks pretty white when you get the report, but. If you are in the midst of SIRS, you're going to see red for upregulated or blue for downregulated. So I guess it's, it gets uh, more patriotic as you, <laughs> the sicker you are. Um, but uh, but yeah, as you as you go through treatment, you should actually see those results normalize, which will mean a fading of those colors because they actually get deeper blue or deeper red as they get more or less uh, up or down or more up or down regulated and the less and the more normal they are, the, the whiter they are. So something to look for and to go over with your doctor as well. So again, it can help you understand what you're currently being exposed to. It can also identify co-infections or considerations for your specific treatment. So it is kind of like a, a path to a very tailored, customized shoemaker protocol where your provider can recommend specific supports for the things that you're experiencing. So like I was saying, uh, you know, I had my doctor interpret my HLA because that was already too complicated for me. Um, the genie is even more complicated in the sense that there's a ton, I want to say like 19 different genes that it is seeing if it's up or down regulated. And they all, they're not like normal names. Like this one tells you if you're inflamed, uh, like it's not normal. They're like, they have very specific names. So generally speaking, you will probably need to get help interpreting the test. Now you can order the test directly through uh, the Genie website and we'll link it below so you guys can ch uh, take a look. Um, but beyond that, you may, um, if you don't order it through your doctor, uh, you may need to seek outside help for interpreting that test. And you can use your doctor, of course, but I know doctors are expensive for their time. So another option that you may wanna look into is actually a coach. And of course you want to work with a coach that has an understanding about Genie, because again, it is complicated. Uh, you'll want to make sure that they're probably a proficiency partner uh, with the Shoemaker Protocol as well. Uh, but of course, uh, as as we plugged in our episode with Christian, um, he is probably a perfect person to have interpret your Genie for you. If you are maybe in between doctors, don't have a doctor yet, or uh, you're just trying to save some costs, I think that's a more cost-effective way of getting your genie interpreted than uh, maybe completely relying on your doctor to explain it to you. Um, that said, if your doctor ordered it, they're probably going to explain it to you anyway, so definitely go with that as well. But either way, get some help on that one because it's uh, it is a complicated test for sure, but it, it's because it gives so much information that uh, can be very informative for you. Absolutely. So, that is the difference between the HLA haplotypes and Genie. Both are helpful in determining, you know, what's going on with you and SIRS. And certainly the haplotypes are super helpful if you do have kids or plan to have kids. Um, it can, it's, to me, it's like the key to preventing anyone from having SIRS again. Could you imagine if everyone had their haplotypes tested and then people took that seriously and building standards changed, you know, what a world can, that would be. We can dream. Um, <laughs> And I, I will say for some doctors, especially if you are very tight on funds, they probably won't force you to do either of these tests. The genie is even more optional than the um, genetic haplotype HLA test. But again, I really encourage everyone to, to get that gene test anyway, the HLA one. Um, it last I saw without insurance, it's like three, $400, maybe a little bit less depending on where you get it. 
I think it's money well spent and you only have to do it once. Once you know that info about yourself, again, it's like knowing you have brown eyes or green eyes or whatever, like it's, you, it won't change. Um, the genie, on the other hand, um, if you are tight on funds, you can do what I did, which was wait until absolutely necessary. And I, I really think that I needed the genie when I got it. Otherwise, I don't know how much longer it would have taken, how much more money I would have spent going down random rabbit holes without knowing that my actual issue was probably endotoxins. So um, if that helps you decide when and whether to get these tests, I hope I hope it does. Uh, I definitely encourage you guys to do it if you can, if you have the resources. But of course, if you need to make cuts, I hope that helps you know which cut to make. Yeah. And in the meantime, if you are looking for more resources and support in your SERS journey, you can join us over at thesersgroup.com. Yep. We'll see you there.